to lead. I'm learning, learning to lead on Jesus. Lord, I'm finding more power than I ever dream. I'm learning, learning to lean on Jesus. Lord, I'm learning to lean. I'm learning, learning to lean. I'm learning, learning to lean. On Jesus, Lord, I'm finding, finding more power than I ever dream. I'm learning, learning to lean on Jesus. Good morning, good morning. I want to say good morning to all of you. I have not had an opportunity to greet. We are going to jump in quick, fast, and in a hurry. First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 8 is going to be our study. I'm going to deal with radical hospitality in a culture of selfishness installment number two. The Lord say the same as if I come back on next month, I'm going to come back to the third installment. And I'm doing this because I want to lay the ground work, the infrastructure for our encouragement ministry that's working in concert with our new member connect ministry. Uh, we've laid out some things that we want to do in terms of a direction for the congregation and so we're trying to move everybody in the same direction so that we can become a little bit more sensitive. Brother Mensu and Sister uh, Patricia Price will be heading the encouragement ministry and we're going to keep laying some layers on it in terms of things that we can do to encourage each other uh, with the special needs that arise in the body from death and dying to all of the other kind of things. So I always like to make sure that we have a scriptural reference for what we're going to do. The last time we introduced radical hospitality, we did it from 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 13. So if you need time to kind of find both of those scriptures, you can kind of uh, get a running start. I'm going to be reading from the message translation, 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse number 8 from the message translation. Most of all, Love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practically anything. The NRV says in verse number nine, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. The message says be quick to give a meal to the hungry, a bed to the homeless cheerfully. Be generous with the different things God gave you, passing them around so that all get in on it. If words, let it be God's words. If help, let it be God's hearty help. That way, God's bright promise will be evident in everything through Jesus, and he'll get all the credit as the one mighty in everything, uncaused to the end of time. Oh, yes. Radical hospitality. 
in a culture of selfishness. Don't have to spend a lot of time convincing you that we live in a very selfish culture. The only three people that most people are concerned about is me, myself, and I. So we don't have much thought or concern for other people. When we talk about hospitality, hospitality is about creating a space to make others feel welcome and to know that they are wanted. So if you're gonna write anything down in terms of a definitional perspective for the study, write that down. Hospitality is about creating a space to make others feel welcome and to know that they are wanted. If there is any ministry, every member of the church can and should be a part of, it ought to be the hospitality committee. This is a ministry where we can specialize in making people feel welcome. If a church is going to grow, if a church is going to be what God would have it to be, we have to get good at creating a people-friendly culture. People who come into the fellowship of the body of Christ ought to feel welcome. They ought to feel like they are wanted. They are accepted. Even if they don't look like us, talk like us, act like us, or smell like us. Say that again, brother minister. For the smell like us. Because there are people who will come in off the street who don't look like you, talk like you, or smell like you, but they ought to be welcome up in here. Am I right about it? That's right. We, we, we have to be careful, and we are grateful. I believe that when we come to the Lord's house on the first day of the week, we ought to wear our best, be our best. You know, so I'm not, I'm not for dressing down like we're going to the ball game to come to church. Now, I know that's, that's comfortable for some people, but, you know, if you're going to dress up and go to a party or a wedding, you ought to dress up and come see the Lord. That's the way I look at it. You know. So while God has blessed us to be able to have dress-up clothes and we come in here grateful that God has blessed us, if there are people who don't have what we have, they ought to feel just as welcome. Because the church cannot afford to become a middle class social club where the only people welcome, the only people who feel like they belong are the people who can belong to the middle class cliques. There, there ought to be a clique that everybody can belong to. And that's the body of Christ. And so we have to have these conversations. We have to be very intentional in being a place where everybody feels welcome and accepted. I said hospitality has to do with how friendly you are. It defines the part of our religious orientation that displays our love and our care for people who are different. And so in our last study on this subject, we talked about hospitality looks like encouragement. Hospitality looks like support and hospitality looks like discipleship. I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, to, today dealing with the support aspect. It looks like encouragement, it looks like support, and then we'll come back if the Lord say the same on next month. I think I'm coming at the last Sunday of, of, of next month. Uh, and we'll do hospitality looks like discipleship. All right. 
I want you to turn, I want you to introduce you to a woman. You may be meeting her for the first time this morning. She's in Luke chapter 13. I want to use her as a uh, segue <clears throat> into our discussion for the remainder of, of the message. We meet a woman in Luke chapter 13 who is named and known by her condition. She has no other name that we know. History has named her. History has judged her. History has labeled her by her condition. She is known by her condition. She is named by her condition. She is a woman who is bent over. Can you imagine? The physical condition of this woman is of such that she cannot walk erect. For 18 years, she has been in a bent over condition. In fact, the, the word in Greek is she's been over double. Now can you imagine having to walk and live and the only thing you see is down. That you cannot, you cannot look up. You can't look people in the face. You can't live your life looking down without missing a whole lot of what's going on around you. And I venture to say that there are a whole lot of people who live their lives bent over, carrying weights. I'm talking about, here it is, Luke chapter 13 and verse number 10. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the message translation. On a Sabbath, did you hear that? On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And the woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, underline that. Jesus saw her. Jesus noticed her. He called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Now, she was not the only person bent out of shape at church. Because the church leaders were more bent out of shape than her. They had a different kind of infirmity. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. And the Lord answered, you hypocrites. Doesn't each one of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for, eight, did you hear that? Satan has kept this woman bound for 18 years and I set her free on the Sabbath day and you more hung up about the Sabbath day than you are about a woman sick for 18 years getting healed. You hypocrite, where are your priorities? That you care more about your rituals. You care more about your tradition than you do about somebody's soul. My God, sound like some folk I know. Got a mic and call themselves a minister or an elder or a deacon in the Lord's church. But our traditions, 
the way we do things, the way we have always done things, we have put more emphasis on the way we've always done it than trying to minister to people. So it's the Sabbath, the holy day. And the Jewish people have come into the synagogue and Jesus is teaching. Like every first century synagogue, the men are in the front and the women are in the back. That was the seating arrangement in the synagogue. Somehow Jesus notices this woman. She's been over. She's grown used to going unnoticed. For 18 years, she's lived her life and has kind of grown used to being bent over and nobody paying her any attention. She's slumped. She's bent. She's hunched. And as the Greek text suggests, she's doubled over. And do you know what happens when you spend 18 years slumped over, bent over by the weight of the world? You miss a lot. You can't live the destiny, my God, I, I'll stay there too long. You, 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 you can't live the life that God destined for you bent over. Legendary Lena Horn said something that I think is, is very applicable right here. She said, it's not the weight that breaks you down, it's how you carry it. Oh my God. <laughs> It, it's, it's, not, it's not the weight that breaks you down. It's how you carry it. All of us have to carry weight. That's the sermon for this morning message. Uh, we all have burdens that we have to carry. And some of us are weighted down by hurts, habits and hangouts but I'm introducing this woman to you because I noticed something you'll get in a hurry and you'll miss it this woman is noticed for the first time in her life she's noticed but what I don't want you to miss is where she was noticed she wasn't noticed at the grocery store. Nobody paid her any attention to give her any help at the casino or at her sorority meeting or at her schoolhouse. She might not have even been noticed at home, but she was noticed at the church. Out of all the places that people who are walking around bent over, carrying the burdens of this world. If they don't get noticed anywhere, wouldn't it be a shame for them to come to church? Come on now. Wouldn't it be a shame for them to come to church and nobody notice that they're carrying a burden so heavy that they can't even straighten up? You know why that would be a shame? Because this is supposed to be the place where we build one another up. Yeah. Ha have you read Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 lately? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, so much the more do what? Spur one another on, exalt one another. Isn't that, isn't that what the scripture said? Exalt one another. This ought to be a place where we notice each other. And I wanted to introduce, I've been exploring some of this because this woman is representative of everybody who, every man, every woman who's ever struggled to rise above the pain of oppression. This woman represents everybody you know who's battling with low self-esteem who's battling with the judgment of others, who's walking around with the, with the 
weight of self-condemnation. They don't value themselves. They've been beat down so long that they don't feel worthwhile. And if there is any place in the world where people ought to feel like they matter and they belong, it ought to be where? It ought to be the church. And we're having these kind of discussions and dialogues to talk about creating encouragement ministries and connect ministries because that's the ministry of the church. How are we going to be the church? And we don't know this folk. Say that again, brother minister. How are we going to be the church? And we don't notice people. Have you forgotten? We are not in the soul saving business. You know what that means? That's the people business. You get to thinking about saving souls. It's a person that has a soul. <laughs> How are you going to be in the soul saving business and not be in the people business? Because every person you meet is a place where God desires to dwell. That's deep, dog. That's so deep, dog. You better say that again. I said, every person you meet is a place where God desires to dwell. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 means. Know ye not that your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. You know what a temple is? It's a dwelling place. It's not just a dwelling place. It's the place where God dwells. Your body. You as a person is a place where God desires to come and live. So when we start seeing people the way God sees them, you see everybody as a place where God desires to dwell. And everybody bent over with the weight of hurts and habits and hangups need to be noticed. And I'm saying, let's be intentional about noticing people. Because the major obstacle to the encouragement ministry is that even though you want to help, people who need your help the most will not always welcome your help initially. It has that been, did, did I get that moan and that groan and that amen because you've been there, you tried to help folk that wouldn't let you help them? Now let me tell you why they won't let you help them. Because they don't know you. They don't trust you. They fear you. See, we fear each other because we don't know each other and we don't know each other because we don't associate with each other and we don't associate with each other because we fear each other. And you know what we fear about each other? It's called rejection. I don't know if I can trust you to get too close to me to know the pain I'm dealing with because I don't know how you gonna handle me. Because you don't, we don't get to know folk. We have a tendency of strapping labels on people. We strap a label on a person, we see a person, we size a person up, we prejudge a person, and we strap the label on them, and we react to the label without ever getting to know the person. You know I'm telling you the truth, because you, you say this stupid stuff like, you know sister so-and-so is all right once you get to know her. She's all right all along, you just didn't know her. Come on, preach, doc. <laughs> Right. So we have all this surface fellowship going on 
because we don't run the risk of being tested for people to try us to see if we really do have an interest that we really do care see this goes all the way back to the garden of Eden watch, watch what happened in Genesis chapter 3 you remember when Adam and Eve had this wonderful fellowship with God and they, they, they had not sinned. They, they, in fact, they didn't even know what prayer was. Prayer came as a result of being estranged from God. Adam and Eve had such a relationship with God that they never had to pray to God. They wanted to talk to God. God came down and visited. So the Lord comes down walking in the cool of the day. And visit with Adam and Eve because these are his children. They're spiritually connected to their daddy. And when the, when the sin takes place, they are duped by the devil. She makes a partnership decision without checking her partner. Eat of that forbidden fruit. And God comes down immediately after that. And Adam is hiding. He's naked. You remember that? See, Adam's core emotion is fear. He said, I was afraid. God comes down. Say, Adam, where are you? He's not asking Adam for information because God had all the information. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. And Adam, he, a, a, Adam said, and I heard thy voice. Put it up on the screen for you since you don't have a Bible. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was what? Why was I afraid? Because I was what? And, and because I was naked, what did I do? I hid myself. So look at, look at the dilemma that human beings are in. Adam's core emotion was fear. I was afraid. And the fear was motivated by exposure. He said, I was afraid because I now recognize I'm exposed. I'm naked. And you've never seen me this naked before so I don't know how you gonna react to my nakedness did you miss that the reason it's hard for people to open up and trust us just like Adam and Eve they had never ever in their life had to deal with the thought of being rejected by God. And so what did they do when they feared rejection? They hid. And all of those people in this assembly this morning that will crowd in here in another 30 minutes for worship, that will sit and we smile and we grin and we fake it until we can make it because we carry in all these secrets all this stuff I don't want you to get too close to me because if you get too close to me you may discover that I'm not like the rest of y'all I mess up sometimes I get it wrong sometimes. You know, I know you super saints, y'all been, been together all y'all life. Y'all can't identify with the rest of us who have to struggle with some stuff. So if I let you get too close to me, you may discover that I'm not a super saint like you, so I don't fit in. So I don't let you. Isn't it a shame? That we can't be real with each other? No, I'm not suggesting that you need to advertise your weaknesses and your wrongdoing to everybody. But I'm saying something is wrong when the church perceives the only way we can be accepted in the church is that we have to be near perfect. When are we going to stop apologizing for weak, sick people at the church? This is a hospital! The church, my God, do you get that? The church is a hospital. You don't go to the hospital because you will. You go to the hospital because you're sick. 
So why are we going to apologize for sick people being at the hospital? We all sick. The only thing we can praise God about, some of us ain't as sick as we used to be. Oh, come on, doc. Yeah, we all sick. But I can praise God that I'm not as sick as I used to be. I'm getting better. I take the doctor's orders. I'm working on my stuff because I know you can't fix what you won't face. You can't change what you won't acknowledge. And you can't heal what you won't own. So I own my stuff. I'm working on some stuff. Now, uh, people who are in hiding develop defensive layers for self-protection. People who are hurting the most, people who need help the most, have all these div diversionary tactics where they throw you off. And they, I'm going to show you what these, these uh, strategy of hiding looks like. So this is Adam's core strategy. He's hiding because he doesn't want to be rejected. Notice people in our fellowship who have a critical spirit. Have you ever noticed the people who criticize everybody. They can't find nothing good to say about everybody. Have you ever noticed why they do it? Well, you know they do it. Let me tell you why they do it. Because they messed up themselves. You see, if I am pointing the finger and have you looking over there at sister so-and-so, guess who you ain't looking at? Oh, come on now. People who are negative, people who are dogmatic, people who are always joking, they ain't serious about nothing. Everything is silliness, everything is joking. They are hiding their pain. It's a defense mechanism. People who are cocky, who are arrogant, the reason they are doing that is they are hiding the fact that they know how flawed they are and they can't deal with it. So they get you off their trail by pointing out how arrogant they are because they'd rather for you to call them arrogant than to call them messed up like they really are. Oh my God. I think we're doing some teaching this morning. So as a result, we have a layer to layer surface fellowship that this is place is not safe enough for me to be real. We can't grow to be the church God want us to be until we are strong enough to first of all own our own stuff. Now let me identify and slay a common myth in the body of Christ. It's not your fault. We hear stuff and we hear it enough we think it's true. You know this little axiom that we all always like to like to like to talk about, you know, the way to have joy is Jesus first, other second, and you last, right? And that's a wonderful formula for joy. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Jesus first, other second, and you last. Now, that's a wonderful formula for joy. It's a poor formula for building relationships. It can't be Jesus a God first and other second. 
You have to be second. You can't love me until you learn how to love who? Oh. So we, we, we heard that little jingle about Jesus first, other second, and you last. And then we translated Mark 12, 29 with that construct. You know, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, spirit, right? And then we say the second is to love your neighbor. But you missed that scripture. Because the first commandment is to love God, but the second commandment is implied and inferred. It's not stated as a commandment. The second commandment is, didn't he say, love your neighbor how? You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. You can't value your neighbor if you don't value yourself. You can't respect your neighbor if you don't learn how to respect yourself. This is the problem in the church. Most of us don't love self enough to honor self, respect self, and love self. Self-care has to be a part of this discussion. You're not going to be interested in helping other people until you can get comfortable with the fact I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together, but I'm better off than some other folk. So while I can't help everybody, that's no excuse for me not helping anybody. My God, why don't you teach, Doc? I don't have to have it all right and together to be concerned about other people and notice other people. Because the more I love me, I only love me because I come to love God. And when I build a relationship with God like I ought to, I spend time with him. Not just time, I spend quality time with him. I talk to him. I listen to him. I study his ways. And I commit to doing more of the things that please him than the things that displease him. And when I learn how to love God like he suggests with my body, soul, spirit, and mind, guess what? I learn how to value myself more. I learn how to see me the way he sees me because God does not see me based on who I am now. He sees me in terms of what I can become. And when I can appreciate God loving me enough to see me with potential, then everybody I see, I have enough grace to say, you may be bent over now. You may be walking, carrying the burdens of your hurts and your habits and your hangups, but I see you in terms of what you can become. I know that if you can ever connect with the Lord, he'll help you straighten up. You may be bent out of shape, but if you can just connect with the Lord, he can help you straighten up. Because the Lord never intended for any king or queen in his family to walk with a bowed down head. Because if you walk with a bowed down head, you cannot look your destiny in the face. I want you to be able to look up because I want you to see your own destiny. I want you to see in you what I 
see in you. And that is, you can be better. You can have more. And you can do more. One final thing, and I'm going to close in two minutes. We'll come back to this on next month if the Lord say the same. So people who are in hiding build defensive layers to protect themselves from rejection. I have to test you to see if I can trust you with my pain. And so when I cry out for help, the cry for help doesn't sound like, will you help me? That's why we're going to spend the training in the next Bible class to show you that people cry out for help and it doesn't look like help. They are testing you. They are in hiding. They don't know how you're going to react. So they test you to see if you really are interested in them. And so they'll say things, I'm talking about even at church. I'm going to throw this out in, in a minute and a half, to give you enough to think about. We'll explore this on the next go around. So a person meets you down the aisle and you all walk into the parking lot together and the person says to you, and they're crying out for help, but you don't know they're crying out for help because you think help means, I'm in trouble, will you help me? But the person says to you, uh, that was not much of a sermon today, was it? That's a cry for help. What I want you to take away and ponder on for the next month is how you respond. Because remember now, they're testing you to see if you're worthy to get close to me. And you have to learn how to respond, not with a closed door response, but with an open door response. See, a closed door response is, no, that was a great sermon. I got a lot out of this sermon. And you may be telling the truth, but you don't know what they meant when they said what they said. You, you now turn this discussion into you. See the trap you walked into? That was not much of a sermon today and now you've made the comment and the discussion about you and what you got out of the sermon. This ought to be about me. I'm the one who raised it. So a closed door response is, no, I don't agree with that. Closed door response is, you know, you're absolutely right. That wasn't much of a good sermon. They're both closed door responses. But listen what an open door response sounds like. Hmm, that's interesting you would say that. Tell me more. Why would you say that? What did you mean when you said that? Because what I just did is validated your concern. I just said to you, I want to know what you think and what you feel. And then that person will now open up to you and say, you know, he preached a great sermon on the Lord's Supper. But I just lost my best friend last week. I would have rather heard today a sermon on death and dying. See the difference? You would never have known they lost their best friend. If you had said, oh, that was a great sermon. See how that works? That was not much of a sermon today, was it? Could mean, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't get much out of any sermon. Because I don't read. I'm 50 years old and I never learned how to read. So I sit in church every Sunday and listen to every sermon and I don't get much out of it. But I decided today to talk to you and just mention, now you get a chance to respond in encouragement. 
Now that I know you don't read well, you now get a chance to say, you know, we have people at the church, or we can find people, if you're interested in learning how to read as an older adult, we can help minister to you in that way. But in the meantime, why don't you and I have Bible study for at least 30 minutes every day, every week, and discuss the sermon? See the difference in an open door response versus a what? Closed door response. We're going to take up that next week. Be blessed.